Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure we welcome the one and only Lori Lieberman. <laughs> the one and only. <laughs> That's great. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for making the time to do this. Oh, a pleasure. It's been so long since, you know, we've actually uh, been corresponding, and it's, it's great to finally have this conversation. It's great to finally catch up. Who is Lori Lieberman? Oh, wow, that's something that I ask myself on a daily basis. <laughs> I'm a um, singer-songwriter. I'm ever-changing, um, ever-growing, ever-learning, trying to be the best person I know how to be. I'm a mom of seven blended kids, three of my own. Um, I'm a dog lover. I am somebody that if I don't spend quiet time writing, then I feel kind of blocked, so I need to write and I need to sing. And that's who I am. What was life like growing up? Um, for me, it was fairly chaotic and pretty interesting because I grew up um, until the age of nine, I grew up in Los Angeles, and then my father invented the um, something like the cottage cheese ceiling. And he wanted to make his business international, so he moved us to Switzerland, where we lived for the next 10, 12 years, a foreigner in, in, in a foreign country. It was an interesting experience. I made some incredible friendships, but it was a very different way of life. I went from palm trees to the Alps to new music that we weren't exposed to in the States and music from the States that we weren't exposed to in Switzerland um, French speaking, and it was a whole different um, lifestyle. What kind of music did you grow up hearing? Well, in Switzerland, the the things that were so popular there were Dionne Warwick, a lot of French singers like Sylvie Vartin and Johnny Hallyday, and a lot of French speaking um, artists. But then my sister went to college in Maine, and when she came home, she brought with her Joni Mitchell. Judy Collins, Leonard Cohen, Tom Rush, Jefferson Airplane, uh, even Janis Joplin, and it, it changed my world. Can you remember a specific album maybe that you especially liked? Oh, yeah. I mean, I wore out Judy Collins' Wildflowers. Just wore that one right out. Also loved Joni Mitchell's Ladies of the Canyon and loved Tom Rush's The Circle Game. You know, just those three, I think, were my, were my three staples when I'd come home from school. Your writing style does very much remind me of Joni Mitchell. Oh, well, I really take that as the biggest compliment ever. Thank you. Tell us about how you discovered the expression of writing. Because I was brought up a foreigner, it was really my only you know, my only release, and, and, and it, it became something that I needed to do. It was an inner dialogue, and, and, and when I realized that I could create a poem form from something that I was writing, it took on a different meaning for me. So it was, became more of an expression. And then when I was able to set that to music, it, it became something that um, I could really make a kind of a like a blank canvas that I could walk away with having filled so it, it felt like that can you remember the first song that you wrote oh yes I do and was it ever profound it was something about horses but I was only <laughs> you know seven years old but I remember you know here come the horses you know, something like that <laughs> and then and then I wrote very profound things when I was 13 about growing old and feeling sad about growing old. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> and yeah. then, and then uh, I remember my first real song that ever had a form was about, of course, heartbreak and love. What is it that you like about the process of creating music? Oh, these are such great questions, Paul. They really are because you know, I've been thinking a lot about that and, and why I love writing so much. I love the choices that I'm faced with, and this is just me, my, my own personal thing. I, I love making a decision as to what word is going to follow another word and how they're going to come off the voice. 
I love the play on words. I love being able to say something in hopefully an original and unique way. It's when I'm absolutely at my happiest and when I feel the most centered, the most focused, and and really the most at home. And kind of on the other side of the picture, from the listener's perspective, what do you want someone to get out of the experience of listening to your music, whether they're listening to you perform or if they're listening to one of your records? I do hope that it resonates with them. I, I do hope that it will inspire. Of course, I think that's every writer's hope, but I really do hope. I've gone from writing songs from a very, um, a, a very dark place, a very dark and confused place. My journey to where I am right now has been circuitous, a twisted road. And, and what I hope, especially on my last record, this recent one, is that it, it, these songs will inspire. Because for me, this, this process of writing this last record was a very quick one. The one prior to that took three years, four years, and this one took only a matter of months. And it started with just one song, if not now. And it, it meant to me that it really at this age, you know, if not now, when? You know, if I'm not going to do what I want to do, when am I going to do it? If I'm not going to speak up, when? So for me, that was the springboard for all of these songs. And they have, uh, I know for myself when I sing and perform this album, I gain strength because all of them, for me, are motivating. You just mentioned the the latest album, Ben Like Steel. What do you think about the new album? I'm so proud of it. I am so proud of it because, as I said, it, it came quickly. It was a very focused effort. It's a very raw recording. It's not a, a heavily orchestrated record. It's basically me and my guitar, me and my piano, enhanced with just three other musicians on it, Lyle Workman, who performs he's an incredible uh, guitarist he added electric guitar and he's on he's on all of stings and beck's recordings and tours uh, i used a percussionist that i love brian kilgore who's done everything from elton john to eminem of course my trusted cellist stephanie fife and when i write an arrangement she writes it down we work so well together she's like my right hand but she contributed arrangements on two of these songs a bassist, Trey Henry. So it's a very small group. What I like about it is one song bleeds into the next with a general theme of growth, forgiveness, moving forward, and letting go of pain from the past. That, that's what this record is for me. And I also covered a couple of songs from some of my earlier days and a unique version, I think, of and perhaps a reimagining of Paul Simon's Cecilia. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting cover choice. What what exactly made you want to record that song? It is an interesting choice, I know, and, I, and I've been asked about that, too, because it's from a woman's point of view, and, of course, singing about Cecilia and coming back to bed and, and what that would mean. I'm a married woman with, with children. But for me, it had deeper um, feeling. It, it you know, as as maybe a, a dream is, is you, every character in your dream could be you. This, for me, was uh, a very symbolic song of someone who actually washes their face of, of, of the past and comes back, back to bed to find out who they, who they truly are. And for me, that's why I recorded Cecilia, um, Paul Simon. I always like to do a Paul Simon song on every record that I do, and I've covered quite a few of his things, so... For me, this was an interesting arrangement and an interesting point of view. What I love about Paul Simon's work is that slowed down and distilled, I can get so much out of his out of his music. And in the last record, I did Another Galaxy. He had written that with Brian Eno, and it was a very rhythmic uh, arrangement. But when I did it my way, I couldn't resist some lines that he has, and that's why. Now, this album, Ben Like Steel... Do you have a favorite song from the album? The one that's most personal and important to me personally is Cup of Girl. I was listening to that song carefully last night, and I wanted to actually ask you about that song in particular. What was the inspiration behind that? Without going too deeply into 
exactly what it is. For, for me, I wrote it about my, myself as a younger artist coming into the business of music and being taken advantage of, and really for any artist who, or any singer who, who can sing but can't speak up. And, and that's what this song is. It's a, a recipe, really, for a young girl who is easily manipulated. And that's why I wrote it. What about this song that opens the album, If Not Now? Yeah, for, for me, that's what began the writing for this whole record. Because, you know, again, if I'm not going to speak up now, if I'm not going to do the things I've always wanted to now, because I've been in this business for many, many, many years, and I'm not in my 20s anymore, then when? When will I? If I'm still going to be nervous and anxious before I go on stage, or, uh, you know, if I'm still scared of flying, if I'm still afraid to take a chance, well, then when? Now is, now is the time. And so that's what, that's what that song is about. I want to kind of go back a few years. Can you remember well the night that you wrote the poem, Killing Me Softly, with his song? It was 1970, and I was about to finish um, all of the songs on my very first record. I'd been signed by Capitol Records. They were waiting for one last song. My girlfriend, Michelle, who's a, a writer, um, asked me to go to the Troubadour to see a singer that she liked so much. I hadn't heard of him, Don McLean. And uh, when I sat there, I wasn't expecting anything. I mean, I, you know, his songs were great. And, but then there was this one song, Empty Chairs, and uh, it blew me away because I was in the middle of a breakup. And I was just mesmerized. And long after everyone left that club, I sat there and wrote a poem on a napkin about my experience of, of hearing him. It wasn't called Killing Me Softly. Um, it didn't have a title. And when I went home, I called the person that I was also having my personal relationship with, who happened to be my manager, producer, publisher, and I told him about this, uh, this experience, and I, I read the poem to him. And he already had um, the title, Killing Me Softly with His Blues, which he used to keep in, in a book of titles. And he put that poem together with his lyric, his title, and um, created that song. What was it about Don McLean's performance of Empty Chairs or the song itself? What was it about that song that you think, what was it that got you so much about that song? Well, I really did feel like at that point, and again, you know, I was pretty young, but I really felt at that point that it was a beeline to, to what I was thinking and feeling. And, and again, going through a breakup, this was a song about coming home to an empty house, to an empty chair, and uh, it just resonated with me so much. Plus, at that time, you know, he was such a such a wonderful artist, and um, and I I just felt that his performance just spoke to me and 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 to what I was going through. I have to say that I've never met Don McLean, and years and years have passed, and he has a book out called Killing Them Softly with My Songs. But when I was just in New York. Um, my cousin from Maine asked if she could bring a friend, and it was Patricia McLean, his wife, and she was in the audience, and, and it was such a, a, a full circle moment for me, and afterwards we spoke, and now Don would like me to uh, do something with him, uh, which would really be a real thrill for me. Amazing. <laughs> I know, I know, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's, that's very... It's very cool. I know. I thought so, too. You know, I mean, I, I just am so looking forward to it, you know. And, and it's a real validation for me, too, Paul, because as the years have gone by, this song still hangs on. People really still respond to it. And the story behind it is something that people still ask me about. It's really validating to know that, you know, he's also, he's got it up on his website. It's very cool. I'm very excited. Now, just in terms of the, all of the songs you've written, could you pick one, not just this latest album, but just, just what, your favorite song that you ever wrote? I think for me there, there's, a, there's a CD called Home of Whispers, and um, that CD is very, very, very close to my, to my heart. I wrote a song that I like so much 
but I actually co-wrote it, and it's something that sticks in my in my brain. It's called "Girl Writing a Letter," and uh, I had read I had read this poem in Best American Poetry. I think it was 1993, and the poem was more like prose and written by an, a professor in Maine, and it was about a robbery in Washington at, the, at at a museum and of a Vermeer painting of the girl writing a letter where a, a burglar comes into the museum and, and enters the painting girl writing a letter and steals the heart of the girl in the painting and brings her to life and off they go on on the highway and he gives her a beer and she's behind the wheel and she's uh, she's alive. And I set that to music and I, I transformed the um the poem into a poetic lyric and i'm very very proud of this of this song because it it resonated with me something about stealing the heart of a girl and bringing her to life which is very very much how i feel in my own life right now and and how i do feel have for some time someone who was closed up and brought to life what is the best thing about being laurie lieberman that I have a, a, a fantastic life, a fantastic life. Uh, it's not a calm life at all. I mean, there's a lot of shouting and screaming and speaking up and speaking out. I'm surrounded by a wonderful and loving husband who is incredible. He's the one that has really uh, kept his arm on my back and said, go for it, you can do this. He's had, you know, quite a lot of um, experience himself, having been in, in a, an actor in, in Saturday Night Fever with John Travolta, and he's gone on to do so many wonderful things. Mainly, he's been championing me as my and my music. And I have three really interesting children who are in their twenties and doing interesting things, and then stepkids who are amazing stepdaughters. And I have three dogs I love so much that when we get off the phone, I'll put them on their leashes and we'll go for a walk. And just the best part of of being me is that I still have this fan base that loves what I do and is there when I sing and asks me online when I'm going to be doing it again. And in the Netherlands, tours and European audiences that are so receptive and new CDs that people are waiting for and Virgin Records that signed me and a feeling that I'm still a viable artist and there's still so much to do. That's an, ex- an incredible expression. <laughs> I've, thought, I've thought about it. It's a very simple thing, but there's so much to be done. Is one yeah. of, is, it really, it's one of the most, the most beautiful things because when we don't have that, it's a, it's a depressing alternative. That's true. <laughs> Option is a very beautiful thing. Yeah, well, right. on that note, what is coming up in the future? You mentioned this Don McLean project. What's coming up? Yeah, uh, um, there's there's that. There's um, a European tour in December. Um, I just got back from New York. I'm going to do more performing there. I hope to come to Georgia and do Eddie's Attic. I haven't done that yet. That's what I'm. That's what I really want to do, um, and I'm going to be formalizing that. And and still writing, touring, performing, stuff like that. I have two final questions. One of them is somewhat lighthearted, and, and the other one is a little more serious. The lighthearted one, what is your all-time favorite meal? <laughs> oh, anyone who knows me, anybody who knows me knows that my favorite thing in the world, and always was and always will be, it's chocolate chip cookies. Oh. So if you ever had me on an island, it would be, I swear to God, and this is just weird, a vat of fresh orange juice and some chocolate chip cookies. Orange that's juice? <laughs> yeah. Huh. I know. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting one. But together, to me, it's the best thing ever. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> that's my favorite thing. Like, when I die at my reception... All I want is for everyone to bring their favorite chocolate chip cookies and, of course, you know, milk or coffee or orange juice. Or orange juice. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. My last question. You have fans all over the world. We have listeners all over the world. What would you like to say to all the people who are listening to this interview? Hmm. I would like to say thank you. 
I'd really like to say thank you for making me feel like it doesn't matter how many years have passed, that you're still there for me, and that together, you know, it's great to connect with you and to hopefully connect with people that you know. And I do hope that you'll let me know if I'm not singing about something that you can relate to. Well, Miss Lieberman, thank you so much for this interview. Mm. Paul, thank you so much. Beautiful questions and thought-provoking and inspiring. So thank you so, so much. And your answers were very inspiring and very touching as well. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you, Paul. All right, thank you. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. Bye.